So in addition to class inequalities of schooling, we can also see racial inequalities in schooling. We can see them very dramatically, actually. And so now I want us to look um, not just at the class dynamics of schooling, but also at the racial dynamics of schooling and through looking at those racial dynamics of schooling to think about how um, we might have a critical race perspective in making sense of how schools work and how they function. So um, uh, uh, critical race theory emphasizes conflict. It emphasizes social conflict, but it does so um, in part by looking at race as a critical um, form of social oppression rather than just class. Sometimes looks at the intersections of race and class, the relationships between them. But race is a source of, is a major source of oppression in American society. And racism is frequently institutionalized within the United States. Earlier lectures, I spoke about how it was that we think about race and race's institutionalization. Um, uh, and here we can think about how race in the institution of schooling creates disadvantages for people of color and benefits for whites. And I think the most dramatic example of this um, that hopefully will speak to you all um, um, sort of powerfully is segregation and just the enormous degree of segregation that we still have in American society. And by segregation, what we mean is what is the likelihood that you live around other kinds of people like you? And in particular, how likely is it that you live in a racially homogeneous um, space? Um, African Americans make up around 12% of American society. So they're not a huge portion of, of society. But if we look at um, uh, African American children's experiences, what we find is that 58% of African American children in the United States attend segregated schools. This is, to me, every time I repeat this statistic, even as someone who knows it, I find it astonishing and unsettling. So I'll say it again, 58% of African American children in the United States attend a segregated school meaning they attend a school where 75% of the children are either Black or Latino. Keep in mind that Blacks and Latinos make up you know, about a quarter of American society, and they're going to schools that are three quarters Black and Latino. This is an example of high degrees of segregation. And Critical race theory sees racism as not just about like individuals and the decisions that they're making and their attitudes, but about how it is that institutions are, or the institutions or organizations within our society help maintain racial inequalities. So it's not just that people decide to act in a particular way that we get racism, it's also that schools are organized in such a way and neighborhoods are organized in such a way that we have high degrees of racialization, high degrees of segregation, and that this helps maintain racial hierarchies. So critical race theorists will look at things like schools and housing and segregation and school funding, the criminal justice system, and show how these types of things reproduce opportunities for African Americans and for whites. So it's not just an analysis of the ways in which um, African Americans are oppressed by or um, uh, held down within a society. It is also a study of the privilege of whiteness and how it is that whites are often advantaged in the, in, by the same institutions that exclude others. Um, in this sense, uh, critical race theorists do not think it's possible to be quote unquote colorblind or race neutral because racial inequalities are built into organizations themselves. Finally, interactionalist theories focus on how it is that interactions matter for young people's experiences. There's some really interesting work, for example, um, by one of my colleagues at Columbia University. Her name is Jennifer Lee, who talks about how 
teachers have really high expectations for Asian students and that these high expectations for Asian students for the most part benefit Asian students because the students themselves get a lot of feedback that they are deeply capable, that they can do it, that they um, are going to be successful. And we know that you know, this kind of positive set of expectations can benefit you. At the same time, we see how other forms of expectations, expectations based in race that may make assumptions about um, your intelligence or behavior could negatively impact other kinds of students. And so those who are interested in interaction, think about how it is that students interact with one another, um, but also how, how teachers interact with students and how those interactions generate outcomes for young people in school. So think about your own schooling experience for a moment. You may remember times where like somebody, maybe you, maybe it was you, maybe it was one of your friends, like if they did something wrong, they didn't really get into that much trouble, but somebody else, when they did something wrong, got into an enormous amount of trouble. And this would lead the scholar to think, to sort of think like, what is the interaction there between the teacher and the student? And why is it that that's producing this kind of outcome? You might ask how rules are enforced or why rules are enforced. And you could think back to your high school or middle school experiences and how some kinds of students seem to, to get a pass all the time with certain sets of rules and others didn't. These things shape students' expectations for themselves as well as their understanding of the overall fairness of the organization and the society that they're in. Reacher has shown consistently that teachers' perceptions of students impact the students themselves. So that if I were to tell you as a student, you know, you're not going to do very well on this exam, you do less well on the exam because I literally influenced you through my articulation of expectations. Whereas if I said to you, you know, I think you're going to do really well on this exam, people like you do really well, you'd overperform, you perform a little bit better than how you otherwise might. And so um, looking at student and teacher interactions, but also student-student interactions becomes an important place in which we could study the inner workings of schools. All of these theories relate to one of the central um, tenets of the sociology of education, which is, education's relationship to inequality and systems of stratification. And here, we think of schools in twin ways. The first is that schools are the critical or primary pathway by which people acquire economic opportunities. And schools are often reflective of existing inequalities and help reproduce those inequalities. And so schools exist in this space of tension. They exist in this space of tension where they both help provide opportunities and limit some of the opportunities of students. This is a complicated process where this happens. I'm gonna spend some time thinking about it. Thinking back to this early slide of the, where we see the benefits of education, but also thinking about conflict theory and how it is that maybe the benefits of education are part of a social reproduction of inequality. Now, in order to see this, um, uh, one of the things that we talk about, when, when, that we look at as scholars is the achievement gap. And the achievement gap refers to differences in academic performance by group. And so we may see achievement gaps by gender, we may see achievement gaps by region, um, so people living in different parts of the country do more or less well on certain kinds of uh, in, in schooling, um, or maybe there's a rural and urban divide in our achievement gap. There may be racial or ethnic achievement gaps. There could be all kinds of achievement gaps. And we're sort of interested in what are the groups that we have in a society and how likely are they to do well within school. Typically, we think of economic and racial achievement gaps. So what are the, what are the um, uh, gaps between black and white students? Or what are the gaps between Asian and Hispanic students? 
or what are the gaps between wealthy and poor students. Um, class gaps tends to be significantly larger than racial gaps. Um, and so what, what, we mean, what I mean by that and what scholars have shown is that wealthier students have far higher rates of achievement than poorer students. This is particularly the case in the United States, but it is not exclusive to the United States at all. So even in places like China and France, where you know, school attendance is driven by your performance on a single exam, we see very significant achievement gaps by economic position. So um, one way that people talk about achievement gaps then is not just as an achievement gap, but as an opportunity gap. Now, these are two different ways of thinking about a similar thing, maybe the same exact finding. In a different lecture, I talked to you all about framing, how it is that we frame issues. And here, we can see how scholars frame issues. In some instances, we talk about an achievement gap. Now, achievements are often things that individuals do. You have achieved things in your life. Opportunities are not things, usually, that people do. Instead, it's experiences that they have or are born into. The difference between an achievement gap and an opportunity gap is a difference in framing of how it is that we talk about an issue. And some of us think about these gaps as being produced because different people have different skills, and so the gap is achieved. And others of us think about the gap as something that's produced. Different people are experiencing different opportunities, and those differential opportunities are generating different kinds of outcomes. Whether or not you think about it as an achievement gap or an opportunity gap doesn't matter for the data, which show these differences, either in achievement or opportunity, depending upon how you think about it, um, um, for people's performances in school. In general, when talking about educational inequality, though, we think about how it is that differently positioned people have different opportunities. Now, the graph here um, um, that I'm showing you is one on the relationship between economic position and performance on tests. And so um, on the bottom uh, x-axis, you'll see people who make less than $20,000 a year, and then on the top, um, uh, more than $200,000 a year. So uh, these are not obviously the students, these are the families that they come from. So these are people who fewer than um, uh, uh, 20,000 and more than 200,000. And this is performance on math in the green, writing in the blue, and purple is critical thinking. And what we see is that across all conditions, people, as they come from wealthier families, have higher test scores. So this is a dramatic demonstration of class-based opportunity gap. Um, that is how it is that wealthy children do far better than poorer children in school. Um, and uh, I'll note that these income gaps have been increasing in the United States, in part because of inequality increasing. So as inequality has increased, so too has this, what I would call a class-based opportunity gap. Um, and some of the most profound differences between people are related to the experience of poverty. So children living in poverty experience really difficult conditions and it is very hard for them to perform well in school. They have inadequate health care, poor housing, housing conditions, often tenuous housing conditions, so they may actually have to move around a lot, lack of access to quality food, um, and this really influences their capacity to perform in school. And so some of the largest gaps, if you see in this graph, really happen for children who come from poor, very poor families. 
homes, families that make less than $20,000 a year. Now, explanations that scholars have for this um, are often about family circumstances. So healthcare, access to food, stable housing, and other kinds of things that the family experiences are very important. But it's also important for us to remember that children don't actually spend that much time in school. You may think you spend all your time in school, but you don't. You, you spend actually of time in your life relatively little time in school. You may be working on schoolwork, um, but if we take you know the um, uh, average American kid, they probably spend what less than um, uh, around less than 180 days a year in school, which is less than half the year. And when they're in school, they're usually not in school for um, uh, more than eight hours. It's actually usually six or seven hours. And um, children are awake for twice as long as they're in school. And so about a quarter of children's waking lives are spent in school. It's still a lot of time, but it's not all of their time. And so we might ask, where are they spending the rest of their time? And part of the answer to that helps explain why it is that there is such a class-based opportunity gap in children's performances. Wealthy families can pay for their children to have schooling beyond schools. So they may go to different kinds of enrichment activities or take additional courses which help them do better. In, in, in addition to that, wealthier families themselves are more likely to have higher degrees of education. So wealthier parents often can spend time doing additional schooling with their children. That is teaching them outside of the context of a school in part because they have a capacity to. So parents' education level affects language development. It affects literacy. It affects a range of parenting practices. And so why is it that we have this class-based opportunity gap? Well, part of the explanation is that parents' education level is influencing children because parents are doing education themselves. Finally, we see um, differences in school funding. Um, differences in school funding where um, children who go to different kinds of schools have different amounts of money dedicated to those schools. In addition to class-based opportunity gaps, we can see racial differences um, uh, in opportunity. And the final explanation that I just gave about how poorer students may have worse funding in their schools, we can see really dramatically in looking at the percentage of students attending high poverty schools. Um, so uh, a high poverty school um, is a, a, a school that's in an area, neighborhood, um, uh, 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 that's poor, or a school where 75% of the students are low income, or uh, at or near the poverty line. And what you'll see really dramatically here are large racial differences between students in terms of how likely it is that students of different racial and ethnic groups attend high poverty schools. Again, high poverty schools are schools where at least 75% of the students are low income. And what we see is that 8% of American children attend high poverty schools as compared to 45% of black children, 45% of Hispanic children, 41% of Native American or American Indian children, and 15% of Asian um, children. And so, you know, it, it, it should be pretty obvious to you here um, that, um, uh, uh, the children of black Americans are significantly more likely, um, uh, you know, uh, five times more likely, um, more than five times more likely to attend a high poverty school. It's a big difference. It's a significant difference in the experience of these students and it helps explain some of the achievement or opportunity gap that we see um, um, for, uh, by race. Um, another uh, uh, thing that we see is that um, 
uh, a disproportionate um, uh, uh, policing of uh, black and Latino students, um, black students in particular here, um, as indicated by the brown uh, Hispanic students in orange, um, uh, 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 Asian students in blue and white students in, in um, uh, red. And um, the likelihood that students are suspended or, or kicked out of school. Um, and uh, if we look at preschool and um, uh, 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 K through 12, um, we see that black students are much more likely to receive harsh punishments and um, for behavioral infractions. We don't know, it's important to know how much of this is due to bias and discrimination, although it is fairly dramatic um, that uh, the rates of out of school suspension among black students is way higher than other groups in K through 12 enrollment. Finally, think about gender and how gender relates to some of these opportunity gaps. Um, as I said in an earlier lecture on gender, in the earlier lectures on gender, it talked about gender as a performance. Um, gender as something that we do, not just something that we are. And this was the idea of performativity in gender or um, gender as a set of relations that um, our structure our experience, but then we enact through our everyday activities. And schools are a critical place for gender socialization. Um, schools tend to reinforce gender roles and heteronormativity, or the assumption of heterosexuality, among students. Um, as I said in earlier lectures, gender is a social construct. So we should think about it as um, something that we make or do or produce and that our organizations and institutions reflect. And returning to the Durkheimian understanding of schools, schools and what their school function is, gender socialization is one of the primary functions of schools. It's one of the things that schools do. Schools and peer groups tend to reward more traditional expressions of gender roles and of heteronormativity. And schools are currently trying to be more inclusive of different forms of gender expression, different forms of expressions of sexuality, but this is also a site of enormous struggle and fight by um, politicians, parents groups, et cetera, some of whom want to preserve a conservative morality around schools and others who want to think about schools as places that are more inclusive and open and expansive in their understanding of what's possible for young students. I'm going to stop here with this set of lectures, um, or this particular lecture. The aim was to get you to think about different kinds of stratification systems within schools, be that gender, race, class, and to have different perspectives from a critical race theory perspective, to understandings of conflicts, to functionalist perspectives, understand what it is that schools do and how it is that schools could be associated with both opportunity and inequality. Simultaneously places that provide some of the greatest opportunities for people, but that often reproduce existing social inequalities in part because of out-of-school dynamics and in part because of in-school dynamics.